Hello everyone. So today you're gonna learn a little bit more about spinal cord anatomy. And I don't have a spinal cord that is independent of the spinal column. So we're gonna work with a model here. And then I also do have a portion of a spinal cord, an actual spinal cord from a cow. So we'll take a peek at that as well to kind of talk about some of the um, characteristics and anatomical features of this structure. So let's get going. So right here, you are looking at uh, the spinal cord inside of the spinal column. And our focus this video is going to be on the yellow pieces. And so as a point to start, you do have your brain and your brain sits inside your cranial cavity. So there's just a bit of the occipital lobe here. And the spinal cord is gonna come out of the brain and it's gonna go through a big hole at the base of the skull that's known as the foramen magnum. And that's really the defining line between where the spinal cords, you may see it peaking in there, and the brain are. So the spinal cord uh, forms developmentally and um, relatively early in the developmental process is what I need to say. And it grows somewhat slower than what we see in the way of bone. So although we have vertebrae that go all the way down to the coccyx here, the spinal cord ends, terminates typically somewhere between T2, 12, L1, L2. And by the time you get down into L3, 4, 5, and the sacrum, you, all of the branches that we have from there are actually branching off of a region that terminates in here between T12, L1, L2. Now, this model is kind of nice because the cervical vertebrae are in blue, the thoracic are in yellow, and the lumbar in, are in blue again. It's important to note that for the spinal cord, we name the area of the spinal cord for where the spinal nerves exit. So remember, I just said that T12 to L2 is the anatomically average place for a spinal cord to end. Now we still have spinal nerves that exit at L3, L4. Those nerves are coming off of the region of the spinal cord known as the lumbar spinal cord, but that's actually gonna sit within the thoracic vertebrae. And that has to do with the fact that the nervous tissue grows at a slower rate developmentally than that of the bone and the muscle and the rest of the tissues that we have here. Now, the spinal cord is going to be named cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral sections. And off of that, we have spinal nerves. And we're going to look at individual spinal cord anatomy too, but this is the gross section. And one of the things I want to show you is this structure here. This is known as uh, the brachial plexus. And so what we find is that from the spinal nerves that come off, each spinal nerve then forms somewhat of a braided network. And you might see that this seems a bit like a braid. And in fact, there's actually a big M in the middle of it uh, that helped me remember the different um, divisions of this brachial plexus. Now you are not going to memorize your plexuses. You don't have to know each neuron that comes off of each of the plexuses. But for our class, it will be important to know what this plexus is. And one of the benefits to, for example, neuron fibers that come off here, braiding themselves into the neuron fibers that came off here, is that it provides a way to maintain control of an appendage if there was some pathology in place. So if this spinal nerve was damaged, I might have weakness, but not complete motor loss because I would have some fibers that had exited through this neuron as well. So plexuses, we do have a cervical plexus, a brachial plexus, a lumbar plexus as well. And you need to know what they are, but we won't be studying them in greater detail in this unit. The spinal nerves are gonna exit through that anatomical piece we learned last term when we were studying our muscles and bones. So when you get two vertebrae that sit on top of each other, the superior articulating faucet and inferior articulating faucet of two different vertebrae form a little cavity here. And that cavity is known as the intervertebral foramina. 
and this is where the spinal nerves are gonna exit. Now, once the spinal nerve exits, as soon as it's out of the spinal cord, and what you don't see here, although I guess they've got a bit of a division there, is that this is gonna divide into an anterior and a posterior division, known as a rami. The posterior division is reasonably smaller because it's just going to go to the musculature and skin of the back. And the anterior rami is gonna branch around to the anterior of the body cavity where all of the internal organs are, more skin, more muscles, etc. Now, it's really important for the spinal cord not to move around a lot inside of the vertebral column. And so the very base of the spinal cord is a anchoring ligament known as the term terminal finale. Um, or terminum finale. And this is gonna anchor itself so that it prevents the spinal cord from moving up and down. If you were to jump up and down, you would not want these spinal nerves moving up and down and perhaps hitting the foramina and doing damage. In fact, if these foramina do get compressed, we oftentimes have to go in and surgically repair that, doing something called a foraminectomy because we're damaging this sensitive neuron nerve tissue. So remember, lots of neurons make up each nerve. And these spinal nerves, if they are damaged and we catch it early, may be able to repair themselves, but typically once you have destroyed the nerve, you lose function permanently, both in the forms of sensation as well as in the form of motor. At the very bottom, there's a bulging as well as up at the top of the spinal cord. So these areas are areas where these plexes attach to, and there are more neurons entering the spinal cord at those particular areas. And as such, the spinal cord has a bit of a bulge in those locations. Because the spinal cord ends, terminates between T12 and L2, that means that we also need to be able to branch our neurons to be able to go out the intervertebral foramina between, for example, L3 and L4, and out all of the foramina that are in the sacral area of the pelvis as well. And these are gonna form, they're gonna go through the greater sciatic notch, and they are gonna form the sciatic nerve, which is going to run along the posterior of the thigh and provide all of the sensory and motor components for your lower appendages. So that branching off of the spinal cord, which remember ended up here, is gonna create this hair-like appearance of nerve fibers that are exiting neurons in the form of spinal nerves that are exiting in this lumbar area. And that creates something called the cauda equina. And so this model is not actually anatomically correct because they actually have put the spinal cord proceeding out the very end. So here's the terminal finale. This very tip of the spinal cord right here at the edge of my thumb is known as the conus medullaris. So it's the, or the medullary cone, that's the very end of the spinal cord. And so then that terminum finale would be a ligament that would extend down the bottom and anchor itself into the bottom of the spinal column, the bony material. And then off of the conus medullaris is branching of neurons that is known as the cauda equina because it looks a bit like a horse's tail. Cauda means tail, equina means horse. And so this cauda equina provides each of the spinal nerves that then we see exiting through the intervertebral foramina in the lumbar area as well as down in the sacral region as well. Now, not only is it important for the spinal cord to be anchored at its bottom to prevent superior and inferior motion inside the spinal column, but it's also important for this structure to not wiggle side to side. And so what you aren't able to see um, but exists are little ligaments that circle the spinal cord in 360 degrees that will adhere it to the lateral walls of the big foramen of the, uh, the vertebral column. And so this helps also prevent the spinal cord from moving laterally side to side and potentially damaging this really critical tissue to the human body. In addition to having the denticulate ligaments, the spinal cord is also surrounded in meninges, which are three different membrane layers that serve a variety of purposes, including buoyancy for this special tissue and providing some cushioning. So between the denticulate ligaments, 
and the fluid-filled cushion wrapped around the spinal column or the spinal cord inside the spinal column that helps protect this very sensitive tissue. So now we're gonna take a minute to look at a uh, real spinal cord that was transected out of a cow. And this spinal cord is only a section. It takes a really long time to do this because the bony cavities that protect a spinal cord are really valuable in helping maintain the spinal cord. I think I'm gonna sit it right here over the sink and this might be challenging one-handed, so bear with me. So we considered the spinal cord from superior to inferior in the last video, looking at the different regions and some of the major anatomy that comes off of the spinal cord. You can actually see elements of what would become the spinal nerve. So if you look right here, you're able to see a little flap and another little flap. These are two pieces. These are the dorsal and ventral root lits and roots that would attach to create the spinal nerve that would be exiting out of the spinal cord. So you can see that it's bilaterally symmetrical. So you have some on both the right and the left. And you can see that this spinal cord section actually includes both uh, or, or would be two sections. So it would cover two vertebrae. Um, the denticulate ligaments are a little bit fine, and so they're not as easy to visualize here and to be able to see how they would be connecting this spinal cord to the spinal column laterally, but it would help hold it in place. Now, in our last video, or sorry, in our last segment, we talked about the meninges, and one of the nice things about this particular spinal cord section is that you can see very clearly, I believe, the meningeal layers. And so what you have is an out tough, outer tough mother known as the dura mater. You have an inner arachnoid mater, and then you have a layer of meninges, a third membrane that lays directly on the surface of the spinal cord um, and creates actually a bit of a shiny experience. Uh, uh, shiny appearance, I should say. So I've made a small incision here so that I can peel back the dura mater and you may be able to see that shiny that sits on the surface of the spinal cord. And so this is a, um, a visual of the pia mater directly on the spinal cord. And now that you're looking at the inside of the dura mater, you're actually looking at the arachnoid mater. So there's a very small amount of space that exists between the outer tough mother, the dura mater, and the inner arachnoid mater. And so when the spinal cord is transversely sectioned as this one is, the arachnoid mater oftentimes adheres itself to the dura mater. Um, the other pieces of information or th anatomical things that we would want to look at with this particular um, spinal cord is to try to visualize both the gray and the white matter. Now, one of the things that's oftentimes shocking to students is that we expect something like this with a really um, obvious gray matter and really obvious white matter. We also expect through models and illustrations that the gray matter is very, very large in the spinal cord. But when looking at the actual tissue, you may notice that it's a bit darker at its center and fairly light around the edges. Let's turn around to the opposite end and see if we see it any better, sort of darker at the center. And that is the gray matter. The gray matter is not as large because the gray matter is the area of the cell bodies. This is the location through which the incoming sensory information and the outgoing motor information is interacting with um, either for sensory, primary and secondary neurons, or for motor, upper and lower motor neurons are synapsing in these, this area. Sometimes you can see, so right at the tip of my thumb, you may be able to see kind of a white line. That is one of the fissures, um, and there are two fissures on the spinal cord, one on the posterior side and one on the anterior side. Sometimes I can get this to pop up the, oh, you can almost see the central canal. So there is cerebral spinal fluid that also goes down the central canal through the very center of uh, the spinal cord as well. 
And that really is sort of the extent of what we can see on the actual spinal cord because it isn't, it isn't an illustration. It isn't a model. It's the actual functional tissue. Now, one of the things that's also interesting, and I think we should probably talk about, is the fact that when you look at this and you see it, it appears hard. It appears like a firm tissue. But it's probably the best description of the organization of the neurons because in the spinal cord we have neurons that are going up and down they're ascending and descending so you're actually looking at the cut neuron end of many of these and then everywhere we have a spinal nerve so here and again here and we have information either entering or exiting the spinal cord we also have neurons that are traveling in the transverse plane and so the best description that I've heard of this was actually a description that was in Michael J. Fox's most recent book about um, his Parkinson's and miscellaneous um, life experiences is that the spinal cord is somewhat like a beaded curtain. It's a condensed beaded curtain though. And so a lot of the fibers, a lot of the neurons are running up and down like a beaded curtain. And yet we have other neurons that are coming and weaving through those beaded curtains to enter and exit out of the spinal cord. So lastly, let's consider the spinal cord in transection and let's do so um, with a model so that we're able to exaggerate some of the anatomical features to be able to see them in greater detail. So the spinal nerves that we talked about that went through the intervertebral foramina, you're gonna have them symmetrical. They're gonna be bilaterally symmetrical. So you'll have a right and a left side. And remember, we're always in anatomical position. So this is the left of the spinal cord and this is the right. From here, we're gonna get branches to other tissues. Inside the spinal cord, the spinal nerve really is just a way to get this information from the inside of the spinal column to exterior to the spinal column. And so each spinal nerve, which is considered a mixed nerve of both sensory and motor information, actually divides inside the spinal column, inside the bone, to form a dorsal root and rootlets and a ventral root and rootlets. you may notice that the ventral root appears different from the dorsal root. And this is because the dorsal root, so on the back side here, brings in all sensory information. Now recall, we previously discussed that sensory information comes from sensory receptors, and those sensory receptors are dendrites out in the periphery of the body. And that the cell body for those dendrites is located here in a structure that is known as the dorsal root ganglion. So the dorsal root ganglion has the cell bodies for all of the dendrites that have been collecting sensory information. And then that information enters into the spinal cord through dorsal rootlets. The ventral side is all motor information. And so from the ventral rootlets to the ventral root and out, this is typically the lower motor neuron in the case of our somatic motor. And it's one neuron, it's one long axon reaching out to the terminal arborizations that are in muscles and create the motion we are so enamored with. Now, if we look at the sensory information, we can see that there's actually two types of sensory information that are coming in. So the green in this model represents the sensory information coming in from your gut. So this is when your stomach is full. This is when your intestines hurt. This is when your lungs feel overstretched or you feel like it's hard to breathe. The sensations that are coming in from the internal organs are coming in in these green fibers. And the yellow represents the motor information that's coming in, the somatic information that's coming in. So the yellow is gonna represent all of the signals that are coming in from your skin, from your epidermis and both your dermis, some proprioceptors, um, things that are out in joint capsules, all of those things are gonna be traveling in along the yellow fibers. So again, you can see on the dorsal side, it's all sensory information. Some of it is somatic, some of it is visceral.
Then if we look conversely on the anterior side, we see red and black. And so the red represents the visceral efferent signal, so the motor signals. This is what causes the smooth muscle to contract. This would be things that would alter, signals that would alter your heart rate. Um, gastric motility, all of those would be in those red fibers. And the black fibers represent the somatic efferent. So these would be the signals, the lower motor neurons that are traveling out to your muscles to cause motor movements. Now, if we look at the spinal cord proper, you'll note that there is gray and white material. And the gray material is divided into three horns. Now this is actually only true, this lateral horn only exists in lower segments of the spinal cord. So in the cervix, cervical, the thoracics, oh, I can't get over my six here. <laughs> the cervical and thoracic uh, horn or areas of the spinal cord, you would only have a dorsal horn and a ventral horn. It's gonna be really important for us to understand our pathways if you know your horns and your columns. So the horns are the gray material and the white are the columns. And so what you get is a dorsal column. You also get a lateral column and you get anterior columns. And this is bilaterally symmetrical, okay? So you have a left uh, posterior horn or dorsal horn and you have a right posterior or dorsal horn. You have a left anterior horn. You have a right anterior horn. The same thing is true for the columns. Now remember in the actual spinal model that I showed you, the actual spinal cord, you could see a little bit of a fissure and that's this fissure right here. And so you also have a dorsal and a ventral fissure. The ventral fissure is larger and that's one of the keys that can be used to identify the dorsal from the ventral or the posterior from the anterior of the spinal cord. Another thing that you might notice here is that there is a hole here and if I, we look sideways, you can actually see they've built this canal up. This is known as the central canal and this is a area that is lined with ependymal cells and is secreting cerebral spinal fluid in addition to what is created in the brain. It is possible to get an ependymal tumor in this area, and an ependymal tumor may create pressure that could alter the function of the spinal cord. So we've talked about the columns. You've got posterior, anterior, and lateral, also known as dorsal and ventral. We also have talked about our horns. We've talked about the fissure, both the dorsal and the ventral fissure the central canal. We also need to talk about something called the gray commissure and the white commissure. Um, the commissure is the area, think about commiserating, it's when you talk back and forth, you have somebody who's sort of on your side. So right here is the commissure. And what this area does is it allows signals to move across the midline and signal the opposite side of the body. So most of us have heard that stroke patients have issues. So if they have a right side stroke, they are more likely to experience left side weakness. And that comes from the crossing of fibers across this area right here on either side of the central canal known as the gray commissure. And so that's gonna become important to us with our pathways as we study our pathways as well. One last note, this is a vascular tissue. You have to be able to support both the glial cells as well as the neurons that are residing in this area to provide nutrients for them and manage their wastes. If nutrients and wastes are not able to flow naturally, accumulations of waste products can cause cell death. And considering that this spinal cord is so very valuable to not only our ability to perceive per, uh, sensations, but also to be able to complete motor function, we want to make sure that this thing is safe. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's encased in a nice bony structure to help protect all of this very sensitive information.